Hey, good evening, everyone. Unfortunately, we are back to our uh, virtual FOF and hoping to go back immediately as soon as the restrictions become a little bit less severe. Uh, but today, I thought uh, you must have gotten bored of seeing Rajiv, me, and Raj. So, I thought we'll introduce another member from our research team, Yashodan Nerurkar. So, Yash uh, has been tracking non lending financial services businesses. And as an extension to that, he has been tracking the power sector because power exchanges are part of his coverage. So it, I thought it would be interesting to uh, get Yash to speak about what he has learned about the Indian power sector and what's been happening in this sector and what's the future going ahead. Uh, we've spoken about the uh, hygiene things about Zoom. So please leave your questions in the chat and we can take them up in the Q&A. So Yash, welcome to FOF and over to you. Hey, thanks, Ronak. Uh, firstly, uh, good evening, uh, all of you, and thank you for taking out the time to join us for the first FOF of this year. And coincidentally, this happens to be my first FOF presentation as well. So I would like to thank the team for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so let's just jump to our topic for today, which is Indian Power Sector 2.0. Uh, so before I get into, you know, what sort of reforms and everything has been underway. So before that, I'll just briefly speak about the history of the power sector. So uh, uh, Indian power sector is like super complicated and you know, it's a very massive ecosystem uh, if you have to consider it. So uh, the Indian power sector started its journey back in 1879, uh, where the first demonstration of electric light was done by a company named PW Fluorine in Calcutta. Uh, and uh, besides Bombay, I mean, even Calcutta was one of the major commercial hubs for the East India company back in those days. So naturally, I mean, all the developments and everything, what it was used to happen. Uh, so Calcutta was, you know, has experienced its, uh, you know, the developments in uh, this space as well. So the first ever hydroelectric uh, uh, plant was installed near Sidrapong, uh, that is for the Darjeeling municipality. Post that, the first thermal uh, power plant was also installed uh, in Calcutta itself. So, uh, I mean, this particular subject of electricity in the constitution is placed as a concurrent subject. So what that means is that basically it gives uh, the, uh, the powers to both the center as well as the state governments to act on it and, you know, to govern in whichever way they choose. So that's, you know, that one of those things has led to creation of state electricity boards as well. And I mean, in terms of deciding about the, uh, you know, legal aspects or regulatory aspects of it, I mean, both center and state can act on it. Uh, apart from that, I mean, uh, the first uh, act which governed the power sector was uh, the Indian Electricity Act, which came out in uh, 1910. Then came the Electricity Supply Act of 1948, uh, which enabled the creation of state elect electricity boards. Uh, the government soon, I mean, towards the year 1970s and 80s, they started focusing on, uh, uh, you know, the generation and transmission segment as well. So this led to creation of companies such as National Hydroelectric Power Corporation, National uh, 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 Thermal Power Corporation, and National Power Transmission Company. So National Power Transmission Company was later renamed uh, to Power Grid in 1992. So to facilitate the trade between the generate uh, all the generating stations and uh, the DISCOM, that is the state electricity boards, an uh, intermediary was set up uh, by the name PTC in 1999. So what this intermediary, intermediary would do is basically uh, it, it acted like a broker. It would buy power from uh, all the uh, generating stations and sell it to the state electricity boards. Uh, then came the Electricity Amendment Act uh, of 1998, which uh, provided for the creation of uh, central and state transmission utilities. Uh, then post that in 2003 came one of the most uh, reformative uh, acts in the Indian history of uh, electricity. Uh, the Act of Electricity Act 2003, which addressed the shortcomings of all the previous acts, and uh, it addressed to uh, break the monopoly of the state electricity boards and you know sort of privatize this sector. So while I was working on this particular uh, sector, I mean two fantastic books which came to my attention were these two. So the book on the left, uh, Indian Electricity Sector under Regulatory Regime, uh, written by Pratik Biswas and Sukanya Mandal. So this book is absolute must read to anybody who ever is remotely connected to the sector or wants to know about the sector in great detail. So uh, this book, it takes you through the entire workings of this uh, sector plus uh, operations, you know, how they are handled. Uh, it gives you a great view into uh, the regulatory bodies and their workings, what are they responsible for. 
and uh, what, what what mean primarily what are they tasked with so uh, and the book on the right mapping power so as you guys know i mean ultimately electricity is kind of a subject which is left to the vagaries of the political influence so there could be uh, you know every state every region they have access to different resources uh, the geographical uh, diversity uh, again i mean every state would have certain legislative say in uh, controlling the sector and nobody wants to let go of that you know legislative power which they hold so naturally uh, i mean it, it it just takes you through how the political scenario in india works relating to uh, the electricity electrical sector so back in 2015 uh, we had uh, i mean uh, in in the previous presentation so rajesh sir had covered this uh, sector and back then he called this sector a menace so and this presentation was followed by a a, a documentary uh, a movie by the name katia bas which talked about electricity theft in india so uh, the reason why he called it a menace i'll just give a small recap of that so back then and in, even till date some of the issues are still persistent in terms of the distribution sector which uh, has issues regarding mounting losses the payables uh, from the distribution companies to the generating companies uh, it's ever rising the i mean the outstanding is more than 100 days and plus so naturally because they were in constant losses they couldn't even invest in, in into infrastructure besides as the uh, electrical market uh, i mean it, it evolves the the new generation facilities are sort of set up it calls for uh, upgradation of the grid as well and since uh, during those times i mean the grid was so poor it it is to frequently collapse uh, to evacuate power from a particular region and uh, uh, to transmit the power to somebody i mean in a, in a particular state which is which has a very high demand it was not a very efficient way to do so this led to many issues in this particular sector besides that there was there was theft there was issues of theft uh even the transmission losses were pretty high the atnc losses as you call it the technical uh, transmission and uh, uh, these uh, losses they were pretty high and uh, because of these reasons uh, there was no sort of development happening in the sector uh in the past 3 4 years itself i mean although we have come a long way from that but point of time but i mean plenty of reforms are underway so slowly throughout the whole presentation we'll just take a look at how, what are the sort of reforms happening in the space so this uh, uh particular thing shows you i mean this chart shows you uh, you know all the dev, i mean the entire uh, broad overview of this entire sector so right from uh, generation till consumption it shows you a chain like how electricity flows from each stage to the next and until it reach, reaches us so if i have to speak about generation first uh, it's a so first of all uh, the indian power sector is characterized by multiple players in each segment so the generation uh, it's it's currently a delicensed activity so what that basically means is that you don't need a license to set up a generation plant uh, except for a hydro plant or if you have anything to do with atomic energy for that you need a license so currently uh, we have roughly 375 to 380 gigawatts of uh, capacity installed out of which around 1/4 that's 25% uh, is renewable uh, capacity installed roughly 50% of that would be private and 20 gigawatt is merchant so merchant power plants are those who at the time of construction and even later they do not have a a power purchase agreement in place so uh, i mean if they have to sell power they basically sell it in the spot market so these purchase power agreements are contract between the uh, buyers that is usually the discoms and the gen generating station to sell power and that is for like a very long period of time uh, closer to 25 years and 88% of our market right now uh, the electricity trade happens in the long term market that is 88% of the market is covered under this unlike generation uh, the transmission and distribution uh, uh, segment is a licensed activity however plenty of reforms are underway uh, in the distribution space uh, which is calling for uh, delicensing this particular segment uh, as well as they want to reduce the entry barrier so that more private players enter this segment the competition increases there are mergers and acquisitions and the uh, the issues with the uh, discoms what they are facing currently the distribution companies they sort of want to mitigate those so you know plenty of reforms are underway in this space uh 
uh, India currently has the world's largest uh, network uh, uh, of transmission, and the interstate transmission network is roughly around 8100 circuit kilometers. So uh, we are moving towards a concept called One Nation One Grid. Uh, I'll get to that concept a little bit later. But the whole idea is that all the regional grids. So India currently has five regional grids: uh, the North, uh, South, West, East, and Northeast. The idea is to connect all these regional grids and have one, uh, you know, single unified grid, which would have a uniform price across India. Uh, currently, India is a power surplus nation. So, uh, besides producing electricity, I mean, generating electricity, we also export electricity to our neighboring countries. We have these cross-border electricity trade agreements in place with the neighboring countries, such as Bangladesh, Myanmar, uh, Bhutan, and you know, a few other countries around. So we have those agreements in place and India currently is a net exporter of electricity. So India has seen a very rapid rise in electricity generation and especially the time period over which this has happened is from 1985 to 2012. So back in 1985, uh, the electricity generation was barely 180 terawatt per hour, which has risen to almost uh, 1057 in uh, 2012. So although India stands uh, at number three position in the countries uh, which are leading electricity generation, yet we are way behind our peers of, uh, you know, China and US. I mean, China is literally almost uh, five and a half times of, of that of India. So we have plenty of catching up to do, but I mean, we are on the way, we are setting up more facilities, we are setting up more renewable plants. So we'll definitely, some, uh, in some way or the other, we'll catch up. Uh, but the thing to note is that uh, India has been, so the reason why the generation has increased by leaps and bound, bounds is because, uh, you know, we have this vision of electrifying all households, uh, the in rising industrial activity and economic activity happening in the nation. Uh, the vision to, um, uh, you know, uh, make sure that power reaches uh, all by, you know, for 24 by 7. So these are some of the reasons why electricity generation has increased to that level. Although India stands at number three, the per capita electricity consumption in a country is still very low and uh, that needs to increase somehow. And, and we are making, uh, I mean, the government is taking steps to ensure that we reach to that level. So out of 380-ish, I mean, uh, gigawatts of capacity installed, 25% uh, of that is renewables. Uh, back in 2008-2009, renewables, uh, uh, I mean, the share in total generation was barely 4%. That has risen to a good 11-12% uh, in FY2021. And besides uh, solar and wind, uh, India is also focusing a lot on uh, other renewables uh, energy projects such as uh, geothermal, hydrogen, etc. So there's plenty of innovation happening in the renewable energy space, and we'll definitely see more additions in, in, in this region. So if you look at this chart, uh, from FY17 onwards, uh, the renewables have accounted for more than 50% of the capacity additions, like the incremental capacity additions. Uh, this feat was never ever achieved in any of the years prior to that, except for the year FI6 and FI9. Uh, I mean, these two could be considered sort of outliers, which are closer to 50%. But apart from these two, I mean, in none of the years earlier, we have managed to reach uh, closer to the 50% mark. So it's like energy and environment could be considered, you know, two sides of the same coin. Uh, it'll not, I mean, adding more renewable capacity will not only ensure energy security, but also uh, address environmental concerns. So India has had set up a target of around reaching uh, 175 gigawatt of capacity additions uh, by the year FY22. So uh, out of that one, uh, 175 gigawatts, 100 gigawatt capacity was to be installed in uh, solar and 75 balance was to be in wind capacity. So, so far we have managed to reach a target of around 45.6 uh, in solar and around 53% in wind. And we have raised this target uh, to reach around uh, 450 to 500 gigawatts by the year FY30. So India has a really uh, complicated power system. And it, I mean, there are plenty of regulatory authorities who are operating at different levels. So I'll just give you a broad structure of how exactly it works in India. So naturally at the top is uh, the central government, the Ministry of Power, who's responsible naturally for uh, 
setting up policies and procedures and uh, monitoring the whole uh, functioning of the projects etc so mainly planning and uh, of the all the policies is tasked to central government the central elect, uh, electricity authority that cea which operates uh, under ministry of power so they advise the central governments the state governments and the regulatory commissions uh, in mat all technical matters related to generation transmission and distribution uh, the electricity commissions which operate at the central and state level they are basically tasked with uh, handling of you know i mean rationalization of the tariff uh, making sure that you know the tariffs are in a proper space uh, they also look after the interstate and intrastate uh, generating stations and the transmission networks so basically i mean this is what they are tasked with the next level is that of system operators so system operators are key uh, intermediary uh, in you know in operation of the grid so what they basically do is say for instance if a particular uh, demand requirement comes up it will be communicated first to nldc so we have one nldc that's national load dispatch center uh, it will communicate the same requirement to the regional load dispatch centers and we have five regional load dispatch centers in turn it will be communicated to the respective state load, load dispatch centers of that respective state so based on availability of you know capacity the i mean basically they make sure that the demand and supply are matched and there's no excess supply or neither there's deficit uh, you know on the power grid and this is what they do so they basically manage this in real time then uh, comes generation transmission distribution so for generation and transmission it is handled at the central state and the private level except for distribution where there are no central players it's only state uh, electricity boards and the private sector a very important and budding mark, uh, thing is the the market right now uh, for electricity trade so electricity trade like i explained earlier 88% of the trade happens in the long term market that is the purchase power agreements and the balance 12% happens in the short term market so short term market again is split into two uh, nearly 55% of the trade uh, happens on the power exchanges and balance 45 or so happens uh, on the in the bilateral market that is the otc market so exchanges also have come a long way so if you have to look at the overall market barely 6% of it gets traded on the exchange but this has risen from 3% uh, nearly 5 6 years back so the exchange there are plenty of uh, products which are being uh, traded over here so such as the day ahead market so electricity can be traded on a days notice um, it can be procured on a term ahead notice that is up to 11 days in advance uh, i mean the electricity can be scheduled up to 11 days in advance and uh, it can be even uh, be scheduled in the real time market uh, besides that we have seen additions in uh, 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 you know the the green energy basket space where even renewable energy uh, trades are getting more attention now and sooner we'll see uh, uh, products in the derivative space like futures and options of electricity and even longer term contracts which will sort of cannibalize the bilateral market so with so much of reforms underway where uh, you know the whole vision is to create a very vibrant electricity sector so naturally comes a need for a power exchange so why exactly is an exchange needed so in 2005 uh, the need for a power exchange was conceptualized uh, where buyers and sellers could uh, uh, you know transact and come up with a uh, like a transparent price so how exactly it works is there are uh, buyers and sellers who will be bidding in the short in the short term market that's on the exchange so there are these 15 minute windows like 15 minute blocks where the buyers will post their bids and sellers will post their bids the intersection of the two uh, is where the uh, market clearing price is determined so this I mean, gives platform to even the buyers and sellers to sort of you know transact and uh, you know schedule power for their needs and it also creates a network effect so basically a a, a discom who has surplus power on the end like uh, you guys know i mean electricity is ultimately a flow not a stock so it cannot be stored so if there's any surplus demand uh, or there's surplus electricity on at a particular discount end, it can even sell it to some other discount who currently is facing a, a deficit for the, uh, to meet its uh, demands. So, uh, I, mean, I mean, when variability has to be factored in, because if uh, a discount on one particular day schedules, uh, I mean, demand for around 10 megawatts of energy, 
suddenly it turns out that you know uh, it's very sunny and it's very hot outside so naturally everyone will start turning on the acs which will lead to a, a rise in the units consumed which will again create for call for more additional electricity needed so that variable demand has will be eventually met in the short term market that's on the exchange i mean what are the better place than the exchange because that's where the most efficient price discovery would happen so the idea of the government is to slowly start moving all the volumes of other uh, even the longer term market has to be moved to the exchange market so that was the whole that is the whole vision of this and that is why uh, it's always essential to run a very vibrant electricity market and a power exchange is needed for the same so in turn what happens is the market participants can manage their portfolio for electricity demands in a much better way and they can use the products under the long term short term or the medium term market so uh, currently discoms for uh, meeting most of their demands they either trade in the long term market or the short term market and short term market again would be uh, the uh, exchanges or the uh, bilateral market so if they have to schedule something in a, on a day ahead basis uh, i mean obviously exchange is the best way to do so but currently what is restricting them is see ideally what they have to do is they have to only uh, trade power if they have to do it in the otc market they have to simply do it with the uh, contractors or the generators with whom they have a contract they cannot go outside the system they cannot buy power from somebody else i mean they have to do it from somebody with whom they have a contract so what happens is ultimately the uh, so and i mean it leads to a very inefficient system because uh, when you're scheduling power from these generating stations the generating stations who have you know from whom you can buy power at a cheaper rate these do not get visibility and ultimately you're paying higher cost to purchase electricity and ultimately that higher cost comes down to the consumers so and and uh, so if you have to ask why uh, these uh, generating stations do not get visibility is because probably there might be transmission constraint or uh, i mean the transmission infrastructure is not developed enough to you know uh, evacuate power from that generating station and supply to the discom or uh, even if it could happen that you know that uh, generating station is not maintained well they have frequent uh, outages which needs to be shut down for uh, maintenance purposes or on a particular day because they are not able to ramp up production to meet the energy demand uh, again they have to they are not sort of ideal to meet the demand in such scenario so these uh, generating stations do not get visibility also some of these facilities are also uh, kept on a standby mode to meet the demand in the real time market so to overcome all these issues where you know to get uh, to have it on a more centralized level what the government has done is they have come out with a discussion paper and it was titled mbed that is market based economic dispatch and it's a whole new concept and probably could be a game changer so what exactly is mbed so uh, when i have to talk about mbed uh, what it proposes is that all the volumes from uh, from the entire power market even the longer term uh, contracts uh, those volumes should be shifted in the short term market and this will optimize the cost uh, in the system and ultimately the benefits will be delivered to uh, the discoms and ultimately to the consumers so mbd is proposing a centralized model as opposed to you know the decentralized approach which was happening earlier where some generating stations were not getting the visibility so uh, i mean ultimately you would have a freedom to choose a supplier uh, based on your choice it's not that you have to simply stick to the uh, supplier with whom you have a contract you can go outside the system and just buy power in the short term market and that too on the exchange so it will ensure that the cheapest power generating uh, resource are dis uh, dispatched to meet the overall uh, uh, system demand so it is estimated that this uh, mechanism will lead to a savings of around 5% uh, in the cost of power and the ministry of power has recognized need to uh, implement this market based economic dispatch uh, in a phased approach so the first phase will begin in april it will go live in april and it will be tested out with the volumes of ntpcs thermal fleet 
So just NDBC, it's thermal feed, the volumes will be tested and the volumes will be coming onto the exchange. And the idea is that it will be done in phased manner because of the market participants like exchanges, uh, uh, the load dispatch centers, they all need to get uh, adapt. I mean, they need to adapt to this changing regime. So this uh, day ahead market, which will be coming onto the exchange, that will also form the basis for transitioning away from India's over dependence on, uh, on the, uh, uh, the PPA market, I mean, the long term contract. So probably that may shift and all the volumes will come to the exchange. But the uh, twist here is that um, it's, I mean, it, though it, this concept looks all rosy and nice and, you know, it sounds good to listen to or even, you know, to implement, it sounds all good, but practically it's very difficult to implement. Firstly, uh, to break these uh, long-term contracts, the purchase power agreements, it's very difficult to do so because the contracting parties are the discoms and on the other end, it's, these are the state electricity boards. Now, implementing something uh, on a central level would be like sort of undermining the authority of the states and nobody would want to let go of the legislative authority which they currently enjoy. So, and again, I mean, if they are any which are earning good amount of money, they wouldn't want to sacrifice that and go into such a model. Uh, besides other issues that would also come up is, so basically right now, discoms, uh, they, I mean, under market-based economic dispatch, they would have to uh, bring the ma margin money upfront for the quantum of power, power procured. And some of these weaker uh, discoms who are financially weak, they wouldn't have the, uh, you know, money to, or even the working capital to uh, deposit that upfront margin. Though there are, uh, I mean, the, the, the draft paper states that uh, credit lines will be kept open to these discoms. But it'll, it'll just be like adding more burden uh, on onto these discoms, which is not really very efficient for them. So again, even they wouldn't be considering that. And right now, this is sort of mandatory for NDPC. However, uh, it's I mean other states could or other generating stations could be uh, I mean they can be encouraged to uh, put their volumes in the short term market on a voluntary basis. So another thing is that, uh, I mean, since uh, we are seeing more trends about, uh, uh, you know, renewable energy or even the EVs which are coming into the market. So EVs basically require a decentralized model and this market-based economic dispatch is totally challenging that and going for a centralized model. So although this all sounds good, I mean, it's a little, pra I mean, practically, if you have to consider, it's a little difficult to implement considering you have to convince all the states and other players uh, to get onto this platform. And ultimately what they are aiming for is to have a unified price. So I'll come to this uh, uh, concept of one nation, one grid, uh, one price uh, in a little bit, in a little while when I'm talking about the transmission sector. So this is the whole idea about MBD. So if your face is somewhat similar to this guy, you know, all confused about listening to all the key buzzwords and, you know, uh, uh, listening about MBD. I mean, it's okay, you're not alone. Even I had the same face when I first heard about this concept. And to add to it, there are a few other concepts such as price coupling. Uh, and, you know, this is another buzzword which is going around in the market. So what exactly is price coupling? So it's it, so to ensure a better system efficiency, uh, it is proposed to combine the bids of all the exchanges in the market, and uh, ultimately there'll be one unified price, not different prices across the exchanges, and that uniform price will be basically the price at which the transactions will happen. So it's basically uh, order matching and price discovery happening at a central level by one player called MCO, that's market coupling operator and clearing and settlement will be taken care of by the exchanges. So introducing a con concept of a uh, price uh, of a price coupling or, you know, the market coupling uh, operator, it's too early to even implement that in India, because I mean, right now our markets are just barely 6% of, you know, I mean, the power exchange is barely 6% of the entire trades happening in the market. So it's not really an ideal scenario to implement that. However, if MBD actually becomes a success, uh, as per the government's vision, the exchange's share could rise up to around 25% by 2025. If that were to happen, we could see multiple exchanges coming on into the market. I mean, right now, uh, 
soon we'll see a third exchange starting its operation soon so uh, i mean there could be scope with the kind of volumes coming on to the market we could see i mean there could be space for even 3 4 or even 5 exchanges to exist together so back in 2010 uh, there i mean in terms of transaction charges back in 2010 the power market regulations had no particular uh, mention uh, towards these transaction charges the reason is back in 2010 uh, the power markets were not developed at all it, it they were at a very nascent stage however over the pa- uh, past 10 years we have seen a rapid progress in the whole space and now uh, electricity actually volumes have risen quite a lot so naturally that calls for uh, regulation in terms of the transaction charges so now in power market regulations 2010 uh, crc wants to uh, approve i mean all the exchanges have to get their ex- transaction charges approved from crc besides this besides this there's another concept of, of bcs that's bilateral uh, contract settlement so it so it just sort of provided for in uh, mbd draft it's a very complicated concept and too technical so i won't even talk too much about it but it's basically uh, the difference between the margin uh, the clearing price the market clearing price and the variable cost of the contract between the discom and the generating station so the difference between the two that will be refunded back to the discom and the discom will be paying the fixed charges outside the system to uh, the generating uh, station so i mean it just mentioned in this particular uh, draft there's nothing much talked about it there's i mean there's barely any talk about it and no clarity has been provided in terms of operation because there are many uh, you know loopholes in this it could so happen that Uh, a, a player could be participating to sell a certain volume on one exchange and it, the other player could be on an, another exchange so how exactly this thing is going to work out there has been no clarity on the subject so if you see the transaction charges across so these are some of the exchanges in europe and uh, even the nord pool so nord pool is a pool of several exchanges in the nordic countries and if you compare that with india india still has a very high uh, transaction charge so this is basically uh, because the indian power markets are very small percentage of the entire uh, power markets in india whereas in other countries i mean they are quite well developed as such so i mean the transaction charges have been regulated and they have come down because of the high volumes so this brings us to the question is coupling really necessary so in my opinion at the moment it's not really necessary and it won't do any good probably when mbd becomes a success we see how the volumes are moving probably then introducing a uh, a coupling authority could actually make sense then so back in 2010 and even post that the uh, crc has been continuously saying that it wants to see the development of exchanges in the market and it wants the vibrant electricity market to be created in india however introducing this concept would actually mean that they are contracting their own statements and because it will be sort of like undermining the authority of the exchanges the uh, main task of uh, price discovery will be done by a third party that is a central party who will be do- collecting all the bits from the exchanges so in that scenario all the exchanges would have no incentive to come out with a with a unique different product and they they would have no uh, incentive to you know sort of innovate and so far in the past 2 3 years we have seen innovation of so many new products in the green energy space in the derivative space in the longer term contracts be it uh, you know any other the real time markets so the exchanges would just lose the incentive to innovate since you're giving that task of price coupling the most important uh, task of you know coming up with a price to somebody else again uh, states have been opposing some of the states have been opposing uh, you know mbd implementation and it so happens that some of these states on the eastern belt have a huge amount of uh, they have plenty of reserves of coal and they usually i mean i mean the power is usually evacuated from these states and uh, transmitted to the states which have high demand so naturally in this process what happens is the, uh, the transmission corridor gets uh, congested and ultimately it leads to markets being split 
so after the markets are split each zone would have a uh, separate clearing prices and the idea ultimately is that india should have one uniform price uh, so ideally i mean just to tackle this issue introducing the concept of price coupling is not really required so at the moment i mean coupling shouldn't be or it won't be necessarily uh, implemented in, in india at this stage uh, another point to be noted is that although coupling exists in european countries however that coupling is across countries not across exchanges and it was man, uh, voluntarily uh, you know exercised by the exchanges themselves after mutual understanding between them and it was not forced upon them so if you see the rise in the short term market and rise in the share of exchanges in total generation uh, in term, in terms of the electricity trade uh, the exchanges have gone from 3% to up to 6% in the year fy21 again uh, <clears throat> the short term market has expanded to almost uh, 11% and we would see you know this going in a positive way so you might have seen this uh, picture as scenery while driving across the state and uh, you, i mean or even somewhere outskirts of mumbai so uh, this looks like a really cheap version of an eiffel tower but sadly they aren't cheap i mean the, the towers aren't cheap and it's nothing to do with uh, with an eiffel tower so these are basically the transmission lines carrying uh, uh, electricity and they, they are basically used to evacuate power from uh, the resource centric regions so the transmission network in india has grown significantly over the past uh, few years primarily to support uh, the growing demand and provide connectivity to the generating uh, projects so the rapid pace of expansion is uh, expected to continue in the future as well because government has a vision of uh, adding more renewable capacities as well as uh, to electrify all households and bring 24 by 7 power to all uh, so right now in the entire power space uh, transmission sector is sort of most attractive for infrastructure investment so just a piece of trivia uh, on an average uh, the, the tars just the construction of a tar it's almost 35 to 40% of the entire transmission network and if you have to consider the foundation of these tars that uh, together would account for around 50% of the entire cost of the transmission network so what exactly is a transmission network and what does it do so it's a complex system uh, it's a just in time system for generating and almost instantaneously delivering the power at any particular location and at a standardized electrical current so for household purposes the electrical current required is around 230 volts but it could differ based on who the consumer is and there are these trans uh, transformers installed on the way which either would step up or step down the voltage levels and deliver the required current as per the requirement of the consumer so these grids are massive systems and they stretch across st states it could be thousands of kilometers or hundreds of kilometers away so just imagine before you flick the switch to switch on a light fan any electrical equipment a fraction of a second ago that electrical current was some form of energy and that form of energy has traveled kilometers or even miles away and has reached your location in barely fraction of a second so basically what this grids do is they connect uh, the generators to the consumers such that any time you demand electricity it is supplied to you so naturally it becomes very key to have i mean the key aspect is that a good transmission a robust transmission network will ensure that you get the uh, you know electricity electricity supply to your houses in an instant so i mean what exactly happens is as if for instance there's a uh, resource centric region and if there is a very poor infrastructure connected uh, to a particular discom the transmission network is broken and you know there's no particular uh, investment done in terms of peak demand these generating plants will not be able to meet the peak demand because of the transmission network is being very poor so considering the variability again which renewables add having a, a efficient trans transmission system becomes very key and it's like the most important piece of equipment in connecting the generating stations to the consumers 
again you know uh, based on variability in demand uh, seasonal demand could be different the demand could be more in on a particular day or even in that particular day itself in the evening you know there's there could be just rising power on some particular day again since india i mean it's a massive country india currently ideally should be having two time zones uh so i mean because of all these vari- variability the transmission network becomes a key of transmitting power from a resource centric region to a demand centric region so how exactly do the transmission companies earn their revenues is uh making sure that the network is available for transmission i mean that's all they got to do i mean it's not the quantum of power which is important is just that they need to make the network available for uh, transmission of electricity so again uh, i mean it's not the uh, quantum of power it's just availability which matters so naturally to keep the network available the uh, uh, transmission company needs to incur significant cost to make sure it's operating at full capacity so uh what could some possible uh, things happen of you know and why is investment in this space very uh, i mean why the expenses go up uh, considerably is because i mean constant patrolling of the transmission network is required uh, to make sure that none of these issues listed out here happen it could so happen that the tower could, could crack uh, the foundation could start aging and wearing off uh, and since these transmission networks are not installed you know road side somewhere they are probably installed somewhere at a remote location in a forest or hilly regions where natural vegetation would become a problem uh, these marker balls could fall off so marker balls are required so that a f- aircraft flying at a very low height could spot one of these transmission networks uh, the wires could just break uh, the, pa- the power lines could just be ruptured so some of these issues are real and they need to be tackled so constant patrolling uh, by the use of helicopters or special drones so these sort of activities are undertaken by the transmission company and that's how they maintain the whole uh, network and make sure that it is available for transmission of electricity so uh, to make sure that uh, the demand is met through also this is a us chart however i mean it operates a kind of similar way in india as well uh to make sure that uh how much of electricity is demanded it is delivered uh all the governments they follow a layered approach uh for uh, i mean producing electricity and delivering it so at the bottom uh would be nuclear and thermal power plants or coal power plants and they have to be run 24 by 7 as they take time to be fired up and to reach a certain level of capacity or to even certain reach a certain level of heat because only then they start generating electricity so since they cannot be shut down because it takes a lot of time to fire them up they have to be operated continuously uh natural gas plants on the contrary they can be fired up in 15 minutes and they are very uh, important in meeting the peak demands so on a particular day if there's variability in the demand uh, natural gas pipe uh, power plants can be fired immediately at a 15 minute interval and they can just meet the power demand in an instant uh solar wind add a lot of variability and they cannot be used to meet peak demand yet if there is some demand which can be met i mean they are they can be used and other sources just make sure that you know these are also added on to the layer so that they can meet uh in like they meet the peak demand so like i said before india currently should be having two time zones so it has commercial implications too so what happens is uh say i mean the sunrise happens early the sunset happens early before it happens in the western part of india and actually i mean uh, you are running uh, two hours of extra electricity in the eastern side so these ha- i mean it has a commercial implication uh, roughly because of a two time rule or two time zone rule roughly 20 million kilowatt of uh, hours of energy could be saved and that's a lot of energy uh, electricity uh, it could be saved and uh, i mean the states which which is currently suffering from power outages i mean that could sort of resolve to some extent so a fantastic book which uh, you know i read on you know the whole matter of grid and how grids have been sort of poorly managed in us and what steps have been taken to sort of develop the grids it's very well mentioned in this book uh, the grid 
and uh, another video which came to my attention on youtube was how electricity gets to us it shows uh, the operations of a electrical grid and how is it very important part in getting the electricity from uh, the the generating station and transmitting it to the consumers so it's a fantastic like a 20 minute video which uh, explains the whole concept of the grid so uh, what calls for a need for growth in transmission assets uh, and like i said before uh, it's a very attractive piece of investment in the space so that is because uh, i mean the key drivers for to drive the uh, uh, growth in transmission sector assets would be the, the growth in demand for electricity uh, addition of generation capacities in the renewable space uh, and besides that, even the modernization of the grid is really important to uh, make sure the grid adopts all the new emerging technologies, the renewable space. So the grid has to be continuously updated for that purpose. Again, India currently has the, this multi-country uh, grid and they have agreements in place with neighboring countries to uh, transmit electricity and to trade electricity. So that naturally calls for more transmission assets and a better network so that uh, uh, electricity can be transmitted effectively to these countries. Uh, again, I mean, the need to reduce the congestion on the networks and uh, to enable that the electricity flows in a congestion free way, uh, a better transmission and a grid system is necessary. So despite having so much of uh, uh, power installed, uh, I mean, capacity installed, uh, some country, some states in the country are still suffering uh, from massive power outages. So the main reason for this is poor transmission infrastructure and currently power evacuation from these resource centric regions is currently bigger problem than power generation in the country. I mean, since I said uh, generation is a de-licensed activity, so it's very easy to start generating electricity, but to transmit it is one of the most crucial aspects and that needs to develop in India. So now uh, let's just jump to the concept of one nation, one grid. So it's basically the, the vision is to be able to transmit electricity at uh, over longer distances such that uh, the price discovered in a particular region is applicable all over India. So India currently has five regional grids and uh, the integration of all those grids happened because every grid has uh, a specific peculiarity about it. So it has, every uh, region has their own salient features. Some regions have plenty of resources available to transmit electricity from these resource centric regions to the demand centric regions is needed by, uh, I mean, th this will be met by like a one grid concept. Also, Another key aspect is that since electricity has to be uh, transmitted over longer distances, the more uh, the, the longer the distance, the more electricity is lost on, during, on the way. So, I mean, ideally, it would call for a more centralized production, but I mean, this can't be possible because it, ultimately electricity will be lost on the way. So, uh, and again, I mean, if you have to consider the type of currents, uh, alternating current, it can be. Uh, I mean, uh, transform into higher or lower voltage, but it's very, uh, I mean, it's not efficient to trans transmit such power over longer distance. However, if you consider direct current, it is very uh, easy to transmit over longer term. So the, uh, the whole grid, which is being considered as, you know, one integrated grid that needs to be set up in such a way that it, it, it should be an ideal mix between AC current uh, and uh, the alternating current and direct current in such a way that for shorter distances, the a AC uh, is used and for longer distances, direct current is used. So the, these, I mean, the integration of grid will lead to better management of resources and operational surpluses from one region can be transmitted to other, other region. So since we have been focusing so much on uh, uh, you know, the renewable space and that brings a lot of variability and it's just not, uh, uh, you know, ideal enough to meet the peak demand. So sun won't always shine and the wind will, uh, won't blow, you know, 24 seven. I mean, obviously there, there'll be a cloud cover, uh, probably due, after sunset hours. I mean, obviously you can't generate electricity, the wind, uh, you know, force won't be the same every day. 
so electricity generation will be quite variable but if we need energy on demand uh, we need storage facilities uh, to develop and they are being evaluated currently so the facilities which are being evaluated currently they are not uh, ideal to be in integrated on a grid level i mean possibly it's too expensive to integrate on a grid level they could be possibly uh, be used to be implemented on a small level such as a township or maybe a small army base or, or even probably a home uh, so which has a solar roof panel uh, installed so probably they could use one of these so if you have to look at some of the technologies which are being developed currently uh the most commonly used is pumped hydro and it, it i mean after lithium ion it, it is a most efficient uh, uh, battery sort of mode available so in terms of cost again it's pretty cheap to install a pumped hydro so pumped hydro is basically water is stored at two levels uh and during non peak hours where there's lesser demand the water from uh, the lower level is uh, transferred to the level above using reversible turbines and the water is pushed back to the lower level again when the demand rises so in such a way the water is conserved and uh, you know uh, and this is the way electricity can be stored this is one of the most commonly used methods the other kind of method which is commonly used is the lithium ion and right now the prices have been dropping consistently but we still need to see a significant drop in prices before they can be uh, utilized in terms of the life cycles again flywheel batteries have the highest life cycle but again to integrate them into a grid it's it will be very expensive to do so and again the efficiency also is pretty low as compared to what a lithium ion would provide so uh, tesla has built the world's largest lithium ion battery in australia and that is connected to a wind farm uh, and it delivers electricity uh, during uh, peak hours so this is some of the developments which are happening uh, in the uh, storage space so this is the kind of battery which tesla has developed for home use so this is so there are two kinds of batteries one is tesla powerwall powerwall 2 uh, and tesla powerwall plus one costs 7500 and the powerwall plus costs 8500 dollars uh, the difference is because it i mean the power plus includes uh, a, a, a solar inverter as well so basically electricity can be uh, stored it can be used as per convenience and these batteries also can be stacked so to meet the power demands based on you know whatever demands you have so uh, and it also comes with the app where you can monitor your use it's sort of like a smart app where you know you get to understand how much of your use is coming from which uh, electrical uh, device and you can sort of tone it down or probably you can manage your uh, energy needs better so now the question is what exactly is happening in india uh, so india has called for uh, uh, around 18000 crore production linked incentive scheme uh, for battery storage ecosystem that involves uh, uh, setting up up to 55 gigawatt per hour uh, manufacturing capacity the center has also called for bids for setting up a uh, a factor, I mean, a factor of around four gigawatt of grid scale battery storage uh, to develop that. NTPC has floated a global tender for 16, uh, uh, sorry, one gigawatt grid scale battery. Uh, Tata Solar Power and Reliance uh, Industries as well, they have been taking up initiatives to develop so, so uh, you know, storage systems. So. Uh, I mean, the kind of distribution sector which we knew uh, was, you know, characterized by mounting losses, poor health, uh, of, and financials. Uh, the AT&T losses were pretty high, and these have been brought down from the previously high levels, and they're still around 21-22% mark. And AT&T losses have been resulting due to inefficiency in billing, or even issues of theft. So, these are the main reasons why AT&T losses happen. Uh, secondly, the transmission and distribution losses also have been pretty high and they are roughly uh, over the 20% mark and that is still more than double of what it is in other countries. And uh, they have also been facing issues in terms of, you know, payables, like uh, the payables to the generating uh, companies and the dues have fallen to around 70,000 crore mark, but still it's a pretty big number. 
so you know back in those days we must have heard about the term load shedding pretty often and you know every time the elect- electricity is uh, brought back i mean this was the kind of expression you know that old lady from the movie swadesh uh, and she was pretty excited to see electricity and you know the bulb light up again and we kind of felt the same back then too so now we are gearing up for a revival or a sort of a revolution in the distribution space and the government has taken this very seriously and uh, reforms are already underway so some of the reforms uh, basically uh, talk about so government basically they introduced a 3 lakh crore uh, incentive scheme for uh, you know making sure that distribution sector comes out of his losses so it's a five year uh, result based scheme uh, to provide financial assistance to the discoms uh so basically the discoms will be targeting i mean obviously it's a criteria based uh, uh i mean they have to meet certain criteria and they have to qualify for this and it will be a state specific intervention and uh it won't be like one size fits all besides the draft electricity amendment bill has also uh, taken steps to ensure that you know this whole sector is delicensed because they want to see more competition happening in the sector they want more activity happening in the sector to make sure that you know the discoms count come, come out of the losses so because the adnc losses are pretty high and you know there's a lot of inefficiency in billing uh, uh this concept of a smart meter was uh, is being introduced and it is already adopted by several states uh, across india so what a smart meter does is basically it uh, so these are prepaid smart meters so similar to a prepaid mobile phone you uh, pay a certain amount Uh, for the smart meter and the smart meter will generate also also data about your consumption uh, and uh, the the use d- during the day and it will be like a completely a uh, data driven thing and the data will also be supplied to the supplier of electricity the discom and based on that uh, uh, i mean once you you are uh, fixed this thing i mean how much of you have prepaid so far if that use uh, I mean you, the balance is over you have to recharge it again so that will bring more efficiency in the billing cycle and again i mean uh, uh so when the balance is low the consumer will be prompted to pay for uh, the you know to add more balance into this uh, smart meter and it, it's going to be a very efficient thing so urban uh, cities with losses i mean the agency losses of more than 15% uh they sorry less than 15% they have to account for i mean they have to adopt this and other cities of uh, where the losses are more than 25% they have to adopt this smart meter and post 2025 it will be adopted on a pan india basis another concept being introduced is the feeder separation so feeder is basically a network a uh, transmission network connected to a particular user so what they uh, are intend to do is they in, intend to introduce around 1000 feeders uh so it will make sure that every consumer gets a separate uh you know network installed to his part for his particular consumption so there are certain uh, section of consumers who need more electricity such as agricultural you know that sector there could be a particular industry who's paying pretty high i mean the charges are pretty high so these kind of become the privileged customers so for them the idea is to have a separate uh, feeder which will reduce the downtime and it will reduce the congestion as well so this is what is uh, being you know thought about in this whole space so once these discoms they uh, you know hear about this proposition of smart meters they literally be just running with their money in the hand they like shut up and take my money i mean they would all be interested to you know go for the smart meters and reduce the losses so uh, before i talk about mobility space uh, i just want to talk about the two models uh, which exist in uh, you know the smart meters so the discoms would have to either uh, install it on a capex model or a, a total expenditure model so in the capex model uh, the, uh, the the discom would do the upfront uh, investment and operation and maintenance charges will be paid on a regular basis the benefits are that they get to share the gains and again uh the data generated from this they can uh, keep the data and they can use it better for their purposes uh and uh it's not suitable for the weaker discoms 
it's only suitable for those who have strong financials and on the contrary the other method which is the total expenditure uh, model uh, there's no need for an upfront capex it's just that you need to pay the balance amount uh, along with the operation and maintenance charges every like monthly on a monthly basis and the benefits of this is uh, there's a subsidy involved uh, there's limited capital uh, requirement it, it i mean these discounts are provided frequent uh, end to end it support as well and the drawbacks are that the data i mean they don't have any control on the data and this is suitable more for the financially weak discoms who are currently suffering from very high losses so if i have to talk about the mobility space uh, so with lot of initiatives around uh, such as fam2 india is poised to witness a transformational growth in this space and electricity uh, electric mobility would be leading the way so to spur this shift uh, decentralization of the grid uh, which is supported by new models such as uh, either a virtual power plant or uh, a concept called vehicle to grid integration of uh, mobility with grids will you know this sort of things will emerge uh, in the years coming ahead and these things are currently not talked about in india but have been have been uh, implemented in other countries and soon the, these things will also be implemented in india so right now there are two charging schemes for electric vehicles which are being talked about because ev is ultimately a high load and they'll affect the power distribution so there are two charging methods which are being discussed about uh, one is coordinated and one uh, the other one is uncoordinated so uncoordinated is basically random charging like you charge whenever you want and that will cause a lot of load onto the system the other uh, method is uncoordinated uh, sorry coordinated charging and the idea behind this is that uh, the consumers need need to be educated and made aware and they need to be encouraged to smartly uh, uh, use the i mean the charging points during the off peak hours so basically at night uh, and to incorporate incorporate the whole mobility space in this the grids have to be uh, you know thought about in a totally different way and the cables and the transmission network again has to be upgraded even the transfer points uh would have to be you know changed because certain evs might require a higher uh, uh voltage levels to charge the vehicle so it depends i mean on you know how this whole thing is getting incorporated in the grid so concept of a virtual power plant it's basically uh, all uh, distributed energy resources so uh, it could be solar i mean the different uh, generation capacities on a on a decentralized level so they could be pool together uh, and these uh, could be managed to uh, i mean they could be co coordinated with a local grid and it, it can be used to integrate the evs into the space and the other concept is of vehicle to grid so vehicle to grid is basically uh, drawing unused power from the vehicle and uh, putting it back into the grid so uh, it can help the energy i mean the energy from the vehicle can you be used to uh, supply electricity during the peak hours so another fantastic book which uh, i mean even rajesh has talked about this author named tony siba he has uh, done a wonderful talk on the subject on youtube plus uh, this book which came to our attention was called clean disruption is a very good book to, uh, and he talks about how uh the whole space about evs and everything will be uh, thought about and how changes are happening at a pretty fast rate and our dependence from uh, conventional source of energy will shift to the renew the renewable space and how the world will be powered by the renewable space so we have talked so much about you know the reforms in the earlier slides uh, how things are shifting in the space so the question is what now i mean we just have to wait and watch as these changes unfold there's mbd there's distribution sector uh, reforms underway uh, there's price coupling introduction of new exchanges i mean all these things are going to take time and uh, we just need to see what happens in the market because it's too early to even judge because these reforms are not even implemented uh, yet uh, on a 100% level so right now again though we might be a power surplus nation we soon could turn to be a power deficit nation that is because uh, if the generation capacities do not uh, add up and they cannot keep pace with uh, the growing demand we will turn out to be a, a power deficit nation secondly we have so much of uh, importance given these days to renewable source of energy 
uh, and we are sort of phasing out all the older uh, coal plants as well. But again, we would need in, uh, uh, these coal plants to exist because till the time you have storage capacities developed, uh, you need coal and natural gas power plants to power the peak demand as well. And renewables are not ideal to do so at the moment. So, uh, I mean, these reforms sound pretty good and revolutionary. They are not implement easy to implement practically yet. And uh, there are plenty of discussions happening uh, and, uh, you know, things are moving pretty quickly, but still, I mean, it'll be a gradual thing and think it'll take two, three years at least for some of these reforms to take shape. So there are too many technical challenges again on the way and, but we can certainly hope for a better implementation through trial runs through various tests. So in the coming years, we can definitely expect uh, much of these things to happen. So that's it from my end and uh, thank you. I, uh, I, I would be happy to take any questions or suggestions from your side. Thank you, Yesh, for a wonderful presentation. I think the level of detail you went in was quite amazing. Uh, I would request uh, people on the Zoom call, if you have questions, just unmute yourself and ask or put in the chat if you want me to ask. Okay, I think questions will keep coming, but I'll just start with my question, if you don't mind, Yash. Yeah. So uh, we've seen so many intermediaries in the uh, sector, and since I am a tech analyst, I am more interested in what technology is behind all these intermediaries, how they operate. So do you know any uh, specific technology tools that are used by exchanges which are noteworthy? So as far as I'm aware, most of these uh, tools which they have developed, they have developed it in-house and they do not outsource it. Because ultimately the key uh, uh, element in operation of our exchange is basically the software which they develop and they have to do it in-house. And that is sort of proprietary to them. So, and they wouldn't disclose it because ultimately that's the sort of the competitive edge which they have over other players in the market. Sure. So essentially in the future, when more and more exchanges come in, they will have their own proprietary tools and they will then have to talk to each other via some sort of a centralized mechanism. Exactly. So, uh, I mean, right now we are seeing uh, limited, uh, you know, competition in the space right now. That is because, I mean, first of all, they have the liquidity on their platforms and that is empowered by the kind of software tools which they currently have. And I mean, it's, it's, it's just that there's so much of developments happening even in the internal side that, uh, I mean, it's, it's just that that becomes a key competitive edge for them. And possibly once market coupling authority or somebody comes in, uh, possibly that's when these things could just go off, uh, you know, of the company's books and probably there could be some uh, outsourcing happening in the space. Sure. Uh, yes, there is a, a query from Priyansh Jain in the chats that can you share the YouTube link again? of one of the slides of how we get power uh electricity how electricity gets to us yeah yeah i'll definitely share that i'll definitely share that yeah somebody i think sachin pandya has shared in the chat so don't worry somebody else has done it for you <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, there's another question from priyansh he says that can you throw some light on smart meters and who could be the beneficiaries so uh, see smart meters is uh, i mean some of the states who have been you know uh, i mean the states who have currently very high atnc losses uh, and who the states who i mean the electricity boards who are in poor financial shape so it is for them basically at the at, i mean the, until 2025 at least so once the smart meter is installed uh, it will lead to first of all it's, since it's prepaid the discount would already get the payment for uh, you know the use of electricity unlike I mean, you know even now i mean you, you are aware i mean in the earlier lockdown days how uh, you know people were sent really high bills and you know most of the people didn't pay and ultimately discoms had to suffer because of that reason so once the prepaid meters are installed you are already paying for what you're using and since once the electricity will be cut off since the balance will be used up then then again you have to make the payment so it's like on a prepaid basis you're paying for it so ultimately uh, the discoms will benefit because they are getting their money and even the consumers will benefit because most of the times what happens, we keep the, the lights running on uh, and we are sometimes not, we are just too casual about it. 
so probably once the uh, data sets come in of how our consumption happens and where are we spending most of the uh, electricity it's similar to you know the screen time on iphone if you probably want to reduce the time you spend on instagram or facebook you just go to that app and you check how much of time you are actually spending on that and based on that you sort of either put a time limit to it or either curtail using it so similarly here are some things where you know you are you know that this is where i'm spending most of the electricity upon probably you can reduce the usage of that so it's ultimately going to be beneficial for the consumers too even the uh, charges could be moderated to some extent and the benefits could be passed on to the consumers too apart from the discoms so both discoms and consumers benefit out of it sure there's one question from uh, chinmay he uh, says what happens to lenders of existing power projects if power market moves to mbed Genco's will lose revenue visibility as no rates or quantity will be guaranteed. So I think Chinmay has answered his own question. But if you want to add something to that point, uh, would be beneficial to him. Sure. So can you just repeat the question? I didn't get the first part of it. What happens to lenders of existing power projects if power market moves to MBED? So they will continue to exist. I mean, it's not that so MBD concept is simply so that the market volumes of these uh, power plants they come onto the exchange platform and they just want to make sure that the electricity markets develop. Right now, it's just that you know these twenty-five-year-old uh, uh, contracts. I mean, the pricing is totally inefficient, or sometimes you know for the variable uh, demand. I mean, they are not able to meet those demands. So because of that, the government wants the uh, trading to happen in the power market. but other things i don't think they they'll be uh, affected ab- about the lending thing and they, there won't be any changes to that <clears throat> another question from chinmay is which part of in the entire power sector value chain looks attractive for investment and why <laughs> so i think i lost you in the first half of the question uh, which part in the entire power sector value chain uh, mm-hmm. looks attractive for equity investments and why tread carefully yash <laughs> <laughs> so uh, like i said i mean the infrastructure space investment in transmission assets that looks very promising because uh, a lot of developments need to happen in a space because that's like the key uh, part in the entire power chain and if you don't if you don't have a robust uh, transmission network ultimately whatever you generate and whatever you consume there's no going to be there's no going to be any link between the two so and since you are incorporating so much of renewables in this space again that needs to be uh, you know delivered on an efficient basis so transmission network becomes very crucial right now and i think most of the in, uh, investments in infrastructure will happen in that space itself great if anybody else has any questions uh, please feel free to unmute i guess there are no questions from the audience uh, thanks again yes i think this is a sector which is usually ignored because it is just available right i mean it's in the background running efficiently and uh, we benefit from it every day but probably don't think too much about the developments there so thanks so much for sharing such an insightful presentation about the sector which we depend on on a daily basis and thanks for the audience for asking really wonderful questions and thanks for attending thank you thank you all for attending whenever things got rough i always remember what my father used to say running a business does test a man my son there are ups and downs glorious highs and sometimes a low that leaves you feeling defeated the character of a man and the character of a business are not very different are they yes but when the chips are down we must stand up dust us heads off and motor on volatility it's a funny thing it makes you question yourself and wonder if you've made all the right decisions sure you can question some of your decisions but stay steadfast on your goals dad always said there are no shortcuts and no quick profits there are no free lunches are there there is only one right way At PPFS, we think like Rahul and his father. That volatility is a fact of running a business, and buying equity shares is like owning a part of that business. We use value investing principles to manage your money. This means we invest in the right businesses at reasonable prices 
and for a longer term. PPFAS Mutual Fund. There's only one right way. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully.